Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, such an honor to be here. Uh, this is a treat for me, because it's not very often that I get a chance uh, to thank people in person who have made such a difference in my life. And this is a room full of people who have done that. You know, your support grounds me. It keeps me on an even keel. It reminds me what I'm supposed to be doing. And you know, it's hard to do sometimes to stay grounded. Uh, we have a tendency to get kind of full of ourselves, those of us that run for office, and begin to think and we're much bigger deals than we are. I'm fortunate in that I have kids, and kids have a unique way of grounding you. And one of my very favorite stories about how my kids ground me is actually a true story. When I was the elected prosecutor in Kansas City, my son was in the second grade, and he had to write a little paper about what his mom did during the day. So he asked me what I did during the day, and of course I puffed up and said, well, you know, son, I run the largest prosecutor's office in the whole state. I'm the number one prosecutor in Kansas City. I have all these other prosecutors that work for me, and we put bad guys in jail, and we work very hard to make sure that you and your friends are safe every night when you go to bed because bad guys can't get you because we're putting them in jail. I am the most important prosecutor in Kansas City. About two weeks later, I get a note from his teacher, and it was a sealed envelope. That's always a scary moment for a parent when you get the sealed envelope marked personal uh, coming home from school. And I opened the envelope, and there was a note from the teacher saying, I thought you might want to save this one for your scrapbook. And there was my son's big chief tablet paper, and at the top of it, it said, what my mom does during the day. And the first line of his paper read as follows. My mom is the best prostitute in Kansas City. <laughs> your kids ground you, but so do your friends. And I have no better friends than the men and women in this room. Uh, there are obvious reasons that you know how to be a good friend. You're special people. You run towards danger to help complete strangers. Whether it's a burning building or being stuck in a crushed car. But beyond the obvious, you have an ability to give unsurpassed support to those people who cherish the same values that you hold dear. I am very lucky to have enjoyed that kind of commitment of friendship from you for over 30 years. You know what, when you say you'll be there, you really mean it. And you've been there for me. And you're there for your communities every single day. And I can assure you, I will be there for you. My admiration for your critical profession goes way back to when I was a child. My father was a volunteer firefighter in the rural community where I was born. He taught us to respect what you do every day. And you know, once you have that in your blood, even though my dad, um, when we moved from the small community, we moved to a community that had a professional firefighting uh, department, so he was no longer needed as a volunteer. But he always chased the trucks. And whenever we were out with dad and we heard the siren, um, we would be taught to pull over, of course. But then after they'd passed, off we went. And I can't tell you how many times we would pull up at a fire scene. My dad would say, stay in the car. And off he would go just to be near what you did, what you did and what you do every day. And then in the late 70s and early 80s, I was a young assistant prosecutor in Kansas City. And that was back in the days when the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration decided they would give out grants to help people prosecute arson cases. And I became. Jackson County's specialist in arson prosecution. As a young prosecutor, I wanted to know more about the crime of arson, and so I went to school to understand CNO, and I asked if I could come to the scene of fires. And so Local 42, uh, even though that was only, I think it only been five years since a woman had ever been hired to be a firefighter in this country, a Local 42 took me under their wing. And they were kind enough to suit me up 
as you can see. And I would respond, they would call me, uh, this, the Cause and Origin Squad would call me when they had a fire that they believed was suspicious in origin, and I would go to the scene of fires. And I had so many firefighters. Um, once I taught them that they had to quit breaking down the doors before they checked to see if they were locked, um, we got along great. Uh, because, you know, there was a tendency to, to bust that door, and of course, you needed to prove whether the door was locked or not, as you made a circumstantial arson case. But uh, that's when I really became friends with Local 42 in Kansas City, and all of the firefighters in Missouri have been my friends ever since. You know, your professionalism and courage you bring every day to work, and you bring it every day to work on someone's worst day of their life. And that's a special, special career. I also am, am very proud that I have continued to fight for what is your right as firefighters. And that is the right to speak as one voice, the right to collectively speak as one voice, to make sure that your wages, your hours, and your pensions not only support you and your families, but support the communities that you protect every day. Budget talk is usually about numbers and not about people. And many times there are people, especially our friends on the other side of the aisle, that forget what taxes pay for. There is no better example of what taxes should pay for than firefighters. It's easy to hate your government, way too easy to hate your government, until your house is on fire. And then everyone thinks the government is pretty dandy. Harold, your great and strong leader, may have said it best last summer when he explained that certain presidential candidates that didn't see any need for more cops or more firefighters or more teachers, he reminded America that technology will not crawl, crawl down a smoky hallway to rescue a child. There's only one person who does that, and that's you. <laughs> Government needs to work better with less, but we can't shortchange the people who choose to serve and protect. The debate that we have about our government and the size of it and the way we fund it should always respect the value of public service. Nobody becomes a firefighter to get rich. Nobody becomes a firefighter because they're lazy. There's really something that drives a person that becomes a firefighter, something in your gut that tells you you're willing to risk your life every day and night of your life to help other people. Now that's a value that should never be subject to the cuts that some people want to make in government services. That's a value that we should respect and lift up rather than demean and marginalize. We need a comprehensive plan to tackle our national debt. And yes, there is some spending that must be cut, but they've got to be smart strategic cuts, and we cannot threaten public safety resources. That is the most basic government function, public safety. A balanced plan won't only ask the middle class to feel the pain while keeping giveaways to big oil and tax loopholes for millionaires and hedge fund managers. If the middle class bears most of the burden, that puts too much pressure on local municipalities, which fund the vast majority of what you do and what you earn. The majority of you make up our country's strength, our middle class. What every country admires about America, you know, yes, they think it's great we have a strong constitution and bill of rights and freedom. And yes, they admire our military. And yes, they admire our rule of law. But what they really admire, they admire our standard of living. Because see, every country has rich people and every country has poor people. But what many countries don't have is a thriving middle class. And that is what you're all about. The middle class is the beating heart of what's best about America, and public servants are the rhythm 
of that beating heart. We need to fight for your pensions and your wages and the rights of you to speak with one voice. What makes our economy strong is not our, just our system of government or our natural resources. What makes our economy strong is consumerism. That's really what's lifted the middle class in this country. A middle class that can afford a second car, a bass boat, that gets time off to take a vacation with their family in the summer that can afford a house and maybe actually afford to send their kids to college. The debates around pensions, tax codes, Social Security, and Medicare need to be driven by one important principle, and that is cherishing and protecting the middle class, and I am looking at it as I stand here today. If this is a race to the bottom, seeing if we can make our wages as low as possible, if this is a race to the bottom to see if we can make sure we have no more pension plans, no more defined benefits, then we will become one of those countries that admires us. We will become a country of rich people and poor people. The problem with the fiscal imbalance in this country, the problem with our debt, there's a lot of reasons that has occurred. Some of them are complicated. But I'll tell you one thing that's not the problem. Firefighters, police officers, and teachers are not the problem in America. It is insulting that people want to talk about firefighters as the problem in terms of our fiscal imbalance in this country. It's insulting. So many places to look, so many changes to make. The last place we should be looking are people who sign up to run towards danger to help a stranger. Balancing the budget on the middle class is about as dumb as it gets. My voice our voice for the crucial middle class families that don't have fancy accountants, that do their own taxes, that depend on their pension, and have worked hard and risked their lives to earn it. That is what we have to have this discussion about. Your choice to serve your community was the first of many commitments I bet you've all made in your neighborhoods. Your moms and dads, your friends and neighbors, you volunteer in your community in other ways, whether it's your church, or your kids' school, you're the ones who show up for everything that makes America special. And boy, did you show up for me. When everyone else was wobbly, when people around this town said I was, frankly, dead meat on a hook, I was toast. No way I could win. Missouri was too red. It was impossible. And you know, people would like avert my glance when I would run into them. I would see someone who I thought might be able to help me and they'd kind of like, you know when somebody looks at you but they look the other way to give you the signal they don't really want to talk to you? That happened to me all the time 18 months ago. It even happened to me all the time a year ago. But it didn't happen to me when I talked to my friends, the firefighters. You guys don't do wobbly. Somebody's been there for you. That's the end of the discussion. And when Harold says it, he means it. And for that, you have my undying respect and you have my undying loyalty. Because of what you did for me and for John Tester, we held on to our seats in pretty red places. Mitt Romney won my state by almost 10 points. He did even better in Montana. But what John and I had in common is we're fighters and we had good friends. We have many testers and McCaskills running next year and you'll have decisions to make. And I hope you will realize that those red state Democrats that we need to hold on to the Senate and to hold on to the values that we cherish and share 
you are going to be a very crucial part of that effort. And I hope that you will do the same thing in 14 that you did in 12, and that is try to focus on those senators who have been good to you and who really, really need your help. The people of this country trust you. They trust firefighters. Your political voice is louder and more full-throated than many because of that trust. The last five weeks of my campaign, almost everywhere I went, I ran into the big yellow bus. Quite a sight. It was almost frightening to me how big my face was. My kids said it was obnoxious. But it was everywhere. And you know, Todd Aiken made a lot of mistakes, but he also had some bad luck. And probably his worst piece of bad luck was him scheduling a big fundraiser at the very same hotel that the Missouri Council of Firefighters was having their meeting. So as Todd Aiken and his guests arrived at the hotel, there was big yellow bus right in front of the hotel. Now, the silly thing was they thought that was going to be the worst of it. They had no idea what was going to be waiting for them inside. And as they walked into the lobby, there were 200 firefighters in yellow. It's resplendent. They were resplendent in the black and gold, right? Claire for U.S. Senate. And of course, the staff didn't know what to do. This was clearly awkward. Um, because uh, the firefighters were at the hotel. They had the right to be in the lobby. They couldn't tell them to leave. And of course, the Aiken people were going crazy. Get those people out of here. What are those people doing here? And the hotel people just kind of shrugged. And I went, yeah, that's one for our team. It was so much fun. And the bus then left, and off it went to another parade, another community. So many people um, have asked me what they needed to do to get the kind of support that I got from the firefighters. They're asking, you know, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Who do I need to talk to? You know, do you need to make a contribution to something? You know, is there some strategic thing I need to be doing? And I said, you know what? Getting the firefighters' support is not complicated. It really, in some ways, is easy. Stand for them. Work for them, keep your word, be as loyal to them as they are to you, and they will be there for you. And I am proud that you were there for me, and I can't wait to the next time somebody wants to pick a fight over your pension or your right to bargain or your right to have your voices heard in this country. On behalf of all the other senators you've helped, please know we do not take you for granted. We appreciate your leadership, we appreciate your leadership team, and we appreciate who you are as human beings. God bless you all, and thank you very much for asking me here today.